All right, guys, so we are getting terrifyingly close to an all-out war in the Middle East right now. Just a couple of days ago, on August 25th, we had this here from Reuters. Israel and Hezbollah in major missile exchange as escalation fears grow. So we have, for months at this point, been talking about the ongoing tit-for-tat back and forth between Israel and Hezbollah and how this could end up in a very dangerous place for both sides of the equation, including also the United States, by the way. We'll get to more of that here in a second. But this seems to be a different category, a step up the escalation ladder, because this recent attack by Israel into Hezbollah, I believe was the largest since the 2006 war. It involved over 100 Israeli jets as a part of this operation. So this is dragging us closer and closer towards not just an ongoing genocide in Gaza, but also a potential explosion of violence in the north of Israel in the south of Lebanon. And then also, in turn, we still have the hovering response that we haven't seen yet from Iran in the aftermath of Israel assassinating the top Hamas political leader, Ismail Haniyeh, on Iranian soil. So we still haven't seen what exactly is the character of the Iranian response to that going to be. Right? Is it going to potentially allow Israel to take the escalation up another notch? Or is it going to be more of a de-escalatory response? Is there going to be no response at all? Yet to be seen. But as all of this, as all of this is happening, right, we also have the US surging forces to the Middle East to quote, keep Iran at bay. So this seems to be the ongoing strategy from the Biden Kamala administration right now is not only are we going to continue the bear hug Netanyahu approach and to give Israel whatever they want, whenever they want, without exercising our leverage over them to force them into compliance with whatever the U.S. goals are, not only is it that, but it's also we are going to position our military in the region to risk a massive explosion of, of violence, of a potential, you know, additional endless war in the region. This is the response from the Biden administration. Now, of course, the U.S. is claiming, well, this is a de-escalatory. It's a de-escalatory positioning of our military forces in the region. They're trying to send the message to Iran, to Hezbollah, to the Houthis, to elements in Iraq and Syria, whoever else, that we're here, we mean business, so don't you dare lay a hand on our little buddy Israel, or we are going to respond in a serious way, right? That's sort of the message that the U.S. is trying to send. Now, the, the difficult part of that situation is that the way that you would actually avoid a potential war with Iran or however this ends up shaking out is actually pretty simple, right? You would end the genocide in Gaza, number one, right? You would work towards an actual sustainable peace in the region. You would end the Israeli decades-long occupation of Palestinians. And in order to do any of those things, even just a ceasefire, the U.S., under the current Biden administration, would actually have to flex some power over Israel, which is something that they seem completely unwilling to do at this point and at any point over the last 10 months. So it's a really dangerous situation, to say the least, right? I don't think that most Americans want us to get into a war with Iran, let alone to get into a war with Iran, not because they attacked us, but because they attacked Israel or because Israel escalated with them, I don't think that that's something that most Americans want to sign off on right now. But it's sort of just like an inevitable trajectory that we are on because of how Biden has handled this entire situation, right? So we continue because we also have this here. At the same time, as the genocide in Gaza is ongoing, as the tit-for-tat escalation with Hezbollah is ongoing, we also now have this, right? This is just from earlier today. Israel launches a large-scale West Bank raid as minister calls for Gaza-style operation. Now, I want you guys to look at this picture. Notice the military vehicle here and the bulldozer over here. So what Israel is doing here, according to the, I mean, in the words of an Israeli minister themselves, they're saying we're going to launch a massive attack on the West Bank that is being illegally occupied, where they are continuing to expand their illegal settlements into Palestinian territory as a part of a slow rolling ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. And they're saying we're going to do a massive attack and it's going to be a Gaza style operation. 
a Gaza-style operation, do I need to remind everybody what Israel has done in Gaza in just 10 months? They have destroyed a vast majority of the hospital system, the education system, the water infrastructure, the food systems inside of Gaza, a majority of the housing. They bombed schools and mosques and churches and refugee camps and UN shelters and targeted journalists and targeted aid workers while simultaneously blocking the aid from getting into Gaza to the point now where people are starving to death, to the point now where there is such a lack of access to clean drinking water and, and other sanitary supplies and medical supplies that there is an outbreak of polio potentially on the horizon right now. Do we need to remind everybody what Israel has done in Gaza over the last 10 months? Because if they are planning to do anything, even if it's one-tenth of what they've done in Gaza to the West Bank, then this is taking it to a completely different level, right? So pretty alarming stuff, right? Now we continue here because this is how, I, I want you guys to focus on this because this is how the Israeli media this is Channel 14, right? A prominent Israeli media outlet. This is how they're talking about this. This is a so-called journalist within Israel. The reason I want you to focus on this is because it gives you an insight, not just to the IDF or the military procedures of Israel or of Benjamin Netanyahu, but just Israeli society broadly. This is a, a mainstream political channel here. And this is a quote from Halal Bit. He says, terrorists in the northern West Bank, the gates of hell have opened. Either you surrender or you die. The gates of hell have opened. Huh? The gates of hell have opened. Now, keep in mind, guys, and I don't say this kind of thing lightly, but in the same way, at least from my point of view, that I think that Ukrainians, for example, have a right to resist Russian invaders... And this is also the position of the U.S. government, by the way. But I think they have a right to resist the people who have invaded their country and are occupying their country illegally. I think that Palestinians in the West Bank also have a right to resistance, to self-defense from illegal Israeli occupation, from the illegal expansion of Israeli settlements and the violence that the Israeli settlers wield against Palestinians in the West Bank. They have a right to resist that occupation. So... When you say terrorists in the northern West Bank, the gates of hell have opened, either you surrender or die, like, to me, the first thing that comes up is, surrender to what exactly? To continued Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory, the continued ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from their land? Like, what exactly are we talking about? It seems like it would be a lot simpler to just end the illegal occupation than to just continuously, you know, fund an arm this ethnic cleansing, and to have to fight a counterinsurgency sort of operation from Palestinians who are fighting against an illegal occupation. That may be a, like a controversial take in some spheres, but that seems pretty straightforward to me. That seems pretty straightforward to me. End the occupation is like step one of this entire situation that we're facing right now, right? Step one is not, let's launch the, you know, 150th incursion into the West Bank to go and try to subdue resistance forces there. It seems like maybe address the thing that they are resisting, first and foremost. You guys tell me if I'm crazy on that. We also had this here from Yunus Tarawi. He says, the military invasion of Deir al-Bala in central Gaza, as well as the cities of Tolkarem, Jenin, and Tubas, has been going on since last night. The current operations are focused on demolishing civilian infrastructure, destroying roads, and blocking entry and exit from these areas. I can't imagine how terrifying it would be to be in one of these places right now and facing this kind of an offensive. I mean, in terms of the demolishing civilian infrastructure and destroying civilian roads, I've showed you this in Gaza countless times over the last 10 months where you'll see Israeli like military engineering vehicles or bulldozers or whatever the case may be, and they will go and just dig up roads. I mean, we saw this, I believe it was in the, um, the outskirts of the Al-Shifa hospital complex. And you look at an above view of what that looked like after the IDF attacked it. And it wasn't just the hospital complex that looked as though it had been faced with bullets and bombs and fire and everything under the sun. But it was also the surrounding roads that were completely destroyed. What is the military objective? What is the, the military justification 
for attacking civilian infrastructure in this way? It doesn't seem like there is one. I read a recent report just the other day, just to remind myself of the trajectory of what has happened since October 7th. And in just like the first month and a half after October 7th, right? From October 7th to I believe like November 22nd it was, there was this Harvard study that was looking at how much damage to civilian infrastructure had been incurred in, inside of Gaza in just a month and a half period. And by that point, they had already destroyed a majority of the healthcare system, a majority of the education system. They had attacked water infrastructure. That was just in the first month and a half. We're now almost a year into this, a year into this. And just imagine the destruction that has been levied against Gaza. And now imagine this, this Gaza style operation in the words of an Israeli minister happening also inside of the West Bank as well. I mean, I, it seems pretty clear what's going on here, right? Now, we also had this here from Ryan Grimm, who points out that the IDF hours ago launched a massive raid aimed at resistance groups in the West Bank and will no doubt be filling up more detention centers as a result. Human rights groups say that there is very little effort made to determine innocence before tor torture begins. That's something I've covered over and over again on this channel is many of the people who they're bringing from Gaza, they're kidnapping from Gaza and bringing to places like Stitimen, this torture facility in the Negev desert in Israel, many of these people are just random civilians, right? I know that, you know, there, there are many Americans or many Israelis who would love to believe that everybody who's in these torture camps are like the most evil and barbaric Hamas terrorist or whatever that you could imagine. But the reality is a lot of these people are just average you know, Joes and Janes, right? They're not involved in military activity. They're barely involved in some cases in political activity at all. And yet they are brought to these places and they are tortured. In some, t in some cases, they are killed, right? And so we had this, I mean, new human rights report details Israel's cruel detention and abuse of Palestinian healthcare workers. A paramedic says that he was brought to a large building like a warehouse where detainees in diapers were suspended from the ceiling by chains attached to their metal handcuffs. Do I need to read that sentence again? Do we need to read that sentence again? This is from Human Rights Watch. I mean, one of the most well-respected human rights organizations on the face of the planet. A paramedic says he was brought to a large building like a warehouse where detainees in diapers were suspended from the ceiling by chains attached to their handcuffs. This is the kind of shit that our government is fully backing right now. This is what we have tied ourselves to the hip with at this point. I mean, this is this is the most inhumane shit that I've ever seen in my entire life. Now, granted, I was too young at that point to understand the media landscape and to understand the political landscape and, and what was actually happening during the early stages of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. But this, to me, seems like a step above everything that I've seen, at least. I mean, it seems as though the IDF makes the U.S. military proportionately seem like doves by comparison, which is saying a lot because the U.S. military are not a bunch of doves, right? We've done torture. We've done plenty of war crimes throughout the years. But what is this? You're, you're hanging paramedics? You're, you're torturing healthcare workers, hanging people up by their handcuffs from the ceiling, putting them in diapers? I've covered so many other forms of torture. There was that report from the Euromed Human Rights Monitor where they came out, they estimated, I think it was like 42 different kinds of torture that Palestinian detainees have been subjected to. What are you even supposed to say to this at this point? We're, we're so far beyond the point of no return. We're so far beyond the concept of Israel has a right to defend itself that it's insulting at this point that anyone would even bring that up as a talking point. What are we doing here, guys? Now, we also have this here, and I think this is important to point out because, again, this isn't anything new. Unfortunately, it's not anything new, but Assal Rod puts these things side by side. You have the CNN article just from earlier today. At least 10 Palestinians killed during Israeli operations in the occupied West Bank. And then you have the comparison to The Onion, a satirical news outlet, right? And they say 10 Palestinians dead after Israeli raid reads headline that could have run any week for the past 75 years. And they're 100% correct because this is nothing new, right? This is part of a decades and decades and decades long occupation and ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. 
that's what this is. This is just the latest iteration of it. And it does seem like as time goes on, it's getting more and more intense, right? They are ramping up the violence against Palestinians. That part of it is true, but to some extent, this is nothing new, right? We also have this here. Israeli forces, at the same time as this incursion into the West Bank is happening, launch several strikes against or across Gaza and push tanks into central Khan Yunus. So apparently right now, there's some sort of like a very temporary, to say the least, if not non-existent ceasefire that's in place in order to try to get people vaccinated inside of Gaza because of this potential for a widespread polio outbreak. I just saw reports earlier that they're already attacking places inside of Gaza. And so I don't know how much of a ceasefire this really, you know, meaningfully is right now. But you're still pushing tanks. You're still doing offensives into Khan Yunus 10 months later. 10 months later. How, how long are Palestinians supposed to be subjected to this game of genocidal musical chairs that Israel has been subjecting them to? We have this report from the AP. The headline says it all, guys. Israeli evacuation orders cram Palestinians into shrinking humanitarian zone where food is scarce. If only there was a word for this kind of thing. Cramming hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people into a tiny space, right? After to completely destroying the rest of their civilian infrastructure, their housing, their medical facilities, their education facilities, cramming them into a space, depriving them of food and water. What do you call that kind of a place? Some sort of a camp? I don't know. You guys tell me. What do you call that kind of a place? A shrinking humanitarian zone. Guys, spoiler alert here. There's never been a humanitarian zone inside of Gaza. There's never been one. Everything has been destroyed at this point. And so, as we continue with the tensions escalating with groups like Hezbollah, escalating with Iran, escalating with the Houthis, with really no legitimate long-term ceasefire proposal on the table right now, or at least not one that it looks like Israel or Benjamin Netanyahu would be willing to you know, truly work with in good faith, as we continue dealing with that, we continue dealing with this ongoing violence that Palestinians are being subjected to in the West Bank, in Gaza, wherever they may be. This is what we are doing right now. And so, again, it's almost like, I, I don't know if it's, it's just Joe Biden is asleep at the wheel, or if it's that he doesn't care, or if it's that he is so ideologically committed to Israel that he wouldn't dare to use any of his power as the most powerful man on the face of the planet, the president of the United States, that he wouldn't use that power to flex on Israel, to force all of this to come to an end. But we are on a deeply, deeply terrifying trajectory right now. One that I don't even know at this point if it's possible to come back from. It would be if we potentially had somebody as president who wasn't Joe Biden, let alone Donald Trump, who would probably be worse in this kind of a situation, let alone Kamala Harris, who it doesn't look like is willing to differentiate herself from Joe Biden in a meaningful way on this policy. But we are on a terrifying trajectory right now. A terrifying trajectory for everybody involved. And the irony of this is, and this is a point that was brought up by Omar Badr, right? He basically said that it's a bizarre situation because it seems like the United States doesn't really want a war with Iran right now, right? It seems like Iran doesn't really want a war with Israel or the United States right now. It seems like Hezbollah, because they've had every chance in the world to do so, doesn't really want a full-scale war against Israel. It seems like you have all of these different factions that are a part of this equation that don't really want a widespread war except for Israel. And yet, we're currently on a trajectory where we are going to allow Israel to like single-handedly drag all of these different factions into a massive war that would be a disaster for everybody involved. Politic guy has the best politic. Believe me, no one does it like him. Believe me, everyone is saying.